having fun? And who are we pretending to be today? Laura? Snake? <sighs> and simulation. No, just a journalist on the run from her evil producer. Touchy. Well, if you're done with your little holographic game of hide and seek, why don't you tell the viewers what's in this issue? No problem. Hey, gang, in this issue, check out Eco. We got the lowdown from the developers in Japan. Then I flew over to Naughty Dog to hang out with the creators of Jack and Daxter. For those of you who thought the 360 camera we used at E3 in our last issue was cool, the folks at NROUTE showed us how they're using it to give you a head-spinning look at things. Head-spinning, huh? It's kind of like a, an exorcist cam. Uh, you know, with the head-spinning. Begin simulation. Now, where did I leave that laser? always the same. On the day before the Final Fantasy movie opened, Square EA threw a little party for all the Final Fantasy fans at the PlayStation Store at Metreon, San Francisco. Final Fantasy fanatics lined up around the block as rumors circulated that the creator of the Final Fantasy universe, Hironobu Sakaguchi, might make an appearance. Inside the party was in full swing, complete with raffles, Final Fantasy games, auctions, and costume contests where the winners received Final Fantasy toy sets, action figures, soundtracks, and exclusive Squaresoft t-shirts. Every so often, a hush fell over the crowd as they showed a video from Final Fantasy X. We wanted to know what some of Final Fantasy's biggest fans thought about the upcoming movie. Final Fantasy rules! Final Fantasy rules! Anticipation of Sakaguchi-san's arrival was definitely on the rise. Sakaguchi, you're my lord and god. Finally, towards the end of the evening, Sakaguchi-san made an appearance. We managed to pry him away from his adoring fans to ask him a few questions, like why the movie was not based on any of the games. The story and characters in Final Fantasy are different each time. And actually, in the beginning, the movie started with the idea that it didn't have to be Final Fantasy or related to it. But as we progressed, the theme progressed into taking the Final Fantasy that I've been working with even deeper. It is very similar to Final Fantasy VII or IX. The title Final Fantasy just seemed to fit. After a press screening of the movie, someone wrote, this is Final Fantasy. I feel the same way in that there aren't similarities when comparing every detail, but the game and movie share the same feeling, and that was really important to me. Since the room was filled with Final Fantasy fanatics, we wondered if Sakaguchi-san thought the movie would cross over to a broader audience. Yes. Even if you don't know anything about the game, you can enjoy the movie. Even in the games. We create them so that you can play any of them without having played the others. 
For example, Final Fantasy X has been created so that you can start playing with that one and enjoy it. People don't need to worry about that and I hope they come see the movie. Making a movie and making a game are very different. But I guess since this movie is a CG movie, the computers and software we use are all the same. So there may be more similarities than differences. Get him to the table. My goal was to make the human characters very lifelike. It was very difficult, but I think our hard work and professional skills have paid off, and we were able to achieve very realistic CG actors. I think that's the biggest difference, since that's something we haven't seen before. Locating pathogens. Finally, we were dying to know whether there will be a Final Fantasy II. I'd like to make one, and I have a bunch of ideas that aren't necessarily sequels. I'm in the process of trying to decide which one to pursue. So yes, I'd like to make the next movie. I hope people will look forward to it. If you can't get enough of Final Fantasy, check the above for the complete trailer of Final Fantasy X. PlayStation 2 was released with the potential to create stunning worlds that game players have never seen before. Now, there's a game where that potential has been realized. Eco is a new game from SEI that puts the player in a wondrous fantasy world on a quest to save a princess and themselves. The story of Eco begins in a small village. Every generation, a boy is born with horns on his head. The boy is believed to be evil, and the villagers sacrifice him to cleanse the village of evil spirits. The boy is led away to a castle to be sacrificed. By sheer accident, he's able to escape. So now he's roaming the castle and trying to find a way out. However, and here this game differs from other games, there is another prisoner in the castle, a girl named Yorda. Iko meets her, and, hand in hand, the two of them try to escape from the castle. It's a different kind of story. Escape will not be easy. Yorda and Iko must first battle many enemies and solve a series of mind-bending puzzles to emerge safely from their prison. The castle is built on the edge of a cliff. On one side of it, there's a terrace with a majestic windmill. On the other side is a vast ocean. The sea breeze blows in and the windmill turns. The castle walls tower above it. It's an extremely beautiful atmosphere. The place feels like a famous tourist attraction. Beyond the amazing scenery, the game is enhanced by the movement of objects, such as the swaying of hanging chains and the turning of the windmill. We were sure that this was done using motion capture, but we were wrong. Well, PlayStation 2 has incredible computing power, but if you import realistic physics into a game, you get something that you didn't expect. It's too realistic. The key is to present it so it looks believable, but it is still exciting gameplay. It took us a tremendous amount of time to master that balance. Well, 
body. We obsessed over the look and feel of the game. We animated everything by hand to capture our imaginations, to bring to life what was happening inside our heads. In the beginning, you've got something that's been clearly and deeply imagined. We investigated a lot of different methods, developing different technical approaches to bring it to life on the screen. We worked really hard at it, and the result is the sort of game that you see. All of their work paid off. Eco shows off the graphical power of the PlayStation 2 to its fullest. Be sure to take a look at this beautiful world for yourself. It's a world where man and machine become one in a race for glory. It's fast-paced, futuristic, and a hell of a lot of fun. Experience the ultimate evolution in racing in Santa Monica Studios' sleek new racer, Kinetica. Kinetica is a futuristic racing game that has characters that put these kinetic suits on that give them certain abilities to race up buildings and have speed in excess of two, three hundred miles an hour. We wanted a very, very fast-paced uh, racing game where the, the, the emphasis was on speed and the maneuverability of the bikes. And uh, we wanted to do something interesting as well. The most interesting thing about Kinetica is that the vehicles are actually kinetic suits that the riders meld into, thus giving the rider incredible agility. In most racing games, the vehicles are kind of boring. I mean, they're cars, you know, the wheels turn. That's really about the only animation that you have on the vehicle. We have very animated characters. They're people. They have wheels attached to the skins. The entire body moves when they do a turn. And we had to develop an animation system that allowed us to do that. But Kinetica isn't just about going fast. As you're racing, you can perform stunts. And if you want to win, you'd better get your tricks down, because more tricks mean more speed. Most of the aspects of this game are about speed, so the stunts, the amount of stunts you do play a direct role in how much boost you have. It all depends on the look of the bike. Each of the bikes have eight unique stunts. She can do backflips. There's all sorts of figure skating stunts. We've used ballet a little bit for some reference material for us, triple toe loops. While you're performing stunts and racing, you'll also need to keep your eyes open for power-ups scattered along the tracks. We have boost pads throughout the track, and they're pretty much self-explanatory. You drive over those, and they push up the horsepower of the bikes quite a bit. You can also siphon boost from the turbo pads. If you press one of the control buttons while you're driving over a pad, you can suck the turbo into the bike to be used at a later date rather than use it at the same time. And we also have crystals throughout the track. And once you pick up five of those, it goes into kind of a slot machine deal. There are some offensive attacks as well. You can pick up a burst attack, which allows you to knock other bikes out of the way, spin them out of control. There's an infinity boost, which basically allows you to just keep pushing it and keep going faster and faster. Super boost, which ups the speed of the boost even more. And then we have drafting, which forms a draft cone behind bikes ahead of you. And if you can maneuver within that cone, you also get more boosts. Kinetica has a unique control system. Why don't you help separate it from the pack of racing games out there? 
in order to make the, the, the bikes feel very uh, fluid and, and animated, we, we're using that sensitivity of the analog stick so that if you lean slightly over, the bike will only move slightly. If you lean the whole way over, the bike will turn very hard. We're actually using both of the DualShock analog sticks, uh, the left one for steering and the right one for uh, braking and acceleration. And then to perform tricks, roll down the R1, and then at that point, that takes away the control of the bike's uh, maneuvering from the left stick. And at that point, you do similar to fighting game type moves to perform stunts, so sweeps and back and forth. And then at that point, all you have to do is make sure that you finish the stunt and let go of that button before you land it. With all of this blazingly fast action on the screen, Connecticut takes advantage of all the power of the PlayStation 2. The PS2 changed the way that we made the game very considerably. We had to deal with many, many more polygons than we did on, on PlayStation 1 games. Connecticut is pushing upwards of 15 million polygons a second. Our, our main characters, the, the bikes in the game, have 10,000 polygons for their highest level of detail. There are 12 bikes on screen at any one time. We were throwing more polygons into one bike than we threw into the entire scene on the PlayStation. Overall, it just made the game look infinitely better. an amazingly beautiful game with levels that you could never imagine. We asked Quinn and Tim to tell us about their favorites. I really like the space station levels. We end up doing this thing where you open up into these pods and you have a lot of alternative paths to get through them. Kinetica is different than other racing games because of the fact that we've allowed people to drive on walls, pretty much go where they feel they want to. The levels that take place in a power station have some really uh, trippy effects in them. Very uh, interesting environment to race in. It's very kind of neon and, and glowing. and It's, it's really, th th those, those levels are really nice. I think that those are probably my favorites. Kinetic is a completely original game and we think it'll blow you away. So get ready to strap on your Kinetic suit and bust some huge tricks. Hey gang, Maggie here outside the headquarters of Naughty Dog Software. Up there, the gang is hard at work on their new game, Jack and Daxter, The Precursor Legacy. My reputation as a journalist must precede me because I'm about to score an interview with Jack himself. Let's head on up. You may recognize Naughty Dog as the folks behind that famous bandicoot, Star of the Crash series. Now they're working hard to make stars of Jack and his buddy Daxter. I'm going to get a little FaceTime with Jack and discuss his rise to fame. I can't seem to find the receptionist, but Jack's got to be around here somewhere. Uh, excuse me, I'm here to see Jack. He's expecting me. Uh, Jack who? Jack. From Jack and Daxter? Uh, yeah, you might want to try the conference room down the hall. H have you guys seen Jack? I had a couple quick questions for him. Uh, Jack is just a CG character, but I can tell you anything you want to know. Uh, he's a poly, not a CG character. What's up with you fleshies anyway, always trying to claim credit for our hard work? Right. Uh, Jack's just a little busy right now. But there's some folks in the studio who might be able to answer your questions. Well, after wandering around the set for a while, I tracked down a few members of the Naughty Dog team who were quite helpful. They told me a little bit about the adventures of Jack and Daxter. Jack and Daxter is about a couple of friends. They uh, have a tendency to get into a lot of trouble together, and uh, there's one particular time at the start of the game where the two of them are exploring a, a forbidden place called Misty Island. As Jack and Daxter are exploring Misty Island, uh, they come upon a little vial, a vial of something they don't know what it is. Dax throws it to Jack, Jack catches it, and as he catches it, it starts glowing. This is part of the magical force Jack has. 
Daxter accidentally got transformed into this kind of rodent form, something he's not very happy about. The two of you are kind of poking around the world, trying to figure out what they can do to change Daxter back into a human. The adventure begins with Jack and Daxter running back to the sage, who's a mentor of theirs, uh, in the village that they grew up in and saying, what can we do? And he says, well, there's only one person I know of that might even be able to help you. He lives far to the north, and you're going to have to go find him. Wow, this eco sounds like some powerful stuff. What the heck is it? Where did it come from? Eco is an energy force that uh, runs through the planet. There are uh, many different varieties. There's blue eco and green eco and yellow eco and red eco. And each one of these different kinds of eco give you different kinds of powers to the game. And you have to learn how to use the eco to your advantage. We have dark eco, which acts as a catalyst for all the other ecos, like blue eco, by itself, you might have um, you know, some sparks, you'd have static electricity rubbing your feet on the floor or whatever, right? You mix some dark eco in there and you've got a thunderstorm, you know, millions of volts and just incredible power. So Jack and Daxter leave their village and set off to find an antidote to turn Daxter back into his human form. I'm actually in uh, Sandover Village, which is where you uh, start the game. Um, there's a bunch of huts behind me, as you can see. Those huts are the uh, dwelling place of a lot of the uh, villagers that you'll meet when you first start the game. And all of these uh, villagers uh, generally have something that they want you to do for them, and you can do these quests and tasks and get a, a power cell in exchange. One particular example is the sculptor in uh, Sandover Village it has uh, lost his muse. She's uh, run away to Misty Island. She's a, a little furry creature. And so when you get to Misty Island, you'll see the muse running around. So if you catch the muse and bring it back to the sculptor, the sculptor will give you a power cell. Oh, the muse! You saved her! Oh, you really are the best. Here, take this power cell. I won't need it now that I have my inspiration back. Well, that sounds simple enough. What else are those two going to be doing? There's a tremendous number of different tasks in the game. Some are incredibly simple, like just find a little hidden place and collect a reward. Others are woven across a number of different levels. A specific example of these tasks would be in the first village, the mayor is complaining that the village has no power anymore because the eco power beam from the jungle is broken. And so you have to go into the jungle and discover that the evil lurkers have diverted the power beam into their machine, and then you have to realign the beam towers all across the jungle to like connect it back to the village. Jack and Daxter face a ton of enemies in the game, like these nasty lurkers who are constantly in their face. But be careful, they're a lot smarter than they look. They're actually quite intelligent. So for example, in many cases, if you come to a gap in a cliff and you jump it, they'll jump it and keep chasing you. But let's face it, Jack would not stand a chance against all those lurkers without a little help from Samos Hagai, the Green Sage, and his daughter, Kayla. Well, one of my uh, favorite characters is actually the uh, green sage, uh, Samus. Samus is sort of your uh, classic wise man, although uh, instead of the typical nice, kindly old man, he's this really crotchety old guy, you know, yells at you a lot. He's always saying things like, why haven't you done this yet? So it sort of adds a uh, element of sarcastic humor to the game. Fine, fine, adventure away then. And while you're out adventuring, why don't you make yourself useful? Hey, lady. What do you say you and I go cruising on this A-Grab Zoomer? Kira is Jack's mentor, the sage's very cute daughter. She's not your typical kind of teenage girl. Instead, she's in there in the, the racer machine shop in their hut, tinkering in the garage, like building this A-Grab Zoomer device. She's like determined to really get them working. Great! You have the 18 cells needed to power my heat shield. The Naughty Dog team spent a ton of time working on the details of the game to get it looking as good as they can, and it shows. All the work has really paid off, especially in the animations. We've created kind of an, a, a unique system for blending different animations to create smooths between what would be two totally separate animations in most other games now. I'll give you an example of this. If you're running along 
You may be halfway in speed between a walk and a run. Well, what our game will do is it will take the walk animation, it'll take the run animation, and it'll evenly blend between them to create a new frame that represents where your feet would be if you're running at that speed. And if you jump, it'll blend all of those things into the jump and create a new unique frame of animation that represents exactly what you'd be at that time. And what that ends up creating is a, not infinite, but a humongous number of possibilities, all of which, every single frame, are created just to get the right animation to make him smoothly move in and out of every one of his frames. And that's truly unique. Smooth moves alone mean nothing unless you've got the look to back it up. And these two definitely have the look. The character design process for this game was very challenging for us because we actually have now the capability of creating characters that we always wanted to see on either a video game or an animated feature. And because of that, the level of detail that Jack has is about six times greater than uh, what the level of detail the Crash had. So for example, Jack himself is more polygons and is more detailed than the entire screen was in a single frame of Crash. Just Jack. It's not only the main characters that look great, but the entire world really comes to life. The team at Naughty Dog have truly pushed the power of PlayStation 2, creating an absolutely amazing looking world for Jack and Daxter to explore. One of the things that really sparked my interest is the particle system. The particle system is a very handy thing. It deals with little tiny chunks of stuff that you can sort of assemble together into making a flame or a piece of smoke or maybe ripples or rain. All of the places in the game are really cool. All I can say is, wow, this new world really shows off the power of PlayStation 2. One of my favorite visual effects in the game is when you kind of battle your way up to the top of the tower over there, the one with the, the rotating disc on it. You can then look down across several levels worth of kind of coastline, and you see your village and the, the beach and look on towards the, the end of the game and you get this awesome sense of like space and it's just very dramatic. Each of these areas are pretty impressive in their own right, but you're going to be amazed at how big and cool this world really is. One of the things we set out to do with Jack and Dexter is to create a giant contiguous world. What that means is once you've actually started playing the game, you'll never have to stop and wait for a load time. You'll never have to pause as you're playing to wait to go into a different area. And the camera never really cuts to say, oh, OK, you were in the forest, but now you're in a cave. So it's a totally different situation. You just walk in and out of doorways, or you walk uh, across a bridge, and you're in a new, a new area. I learned a ton about the game from Jason and his team at Naughty Dog, but I still didn't get to meet Jack. So I decided that instead of waiting for the game, I'd wait for him. Is Jack here yet? Nope. Jack here yet? No. Is Jack here yet? No. Is Jack here yet? No. Is Jack here yet? No. Riffle came to 2002 is from the ground up a new gaming experience. It's got the best graphics, it's most technically advanced. This game is the best game that's ever been made. We had to pretty much redesign this game this year from the bottom up because the PlayStation 2 is a brand new platform. There's things that you can do on the PlayStation 2 you've never done on previous platforms. We have a significant amount of tackles, upwards around uh, 70 to 90 different tackles. We've got two guys taking one guy down. We've got three guys taking one guy down. I don't want the players just to hit each other. I want them to need a hug from their mother when they're done playing this game. It's not for the meek. Well, we are NFL game day, which means the NFL is a big part of it. We brought in experts from the NFL to show us, hey, how do you capture an NFL game? Where do you place the camera? What kind of camera cuts do you do in what situations? Everything is modeled exactly the finest detail, just like the real NFL. You're going to see, you know, when the guy throws a ball, he's going to hold the ball, he's going to throw it, and his hand's going to open. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of those kind of details that add up to the total game experience. Our goal is to have someone walk in the room and look at the, the TV and say, hey, what game are you watching? You know, I say, yeah, I'm not watching the game, I'm playing game day.
Hi, I'm Jesse from the 3DO company. Today I'm going to show you a cool move for Army Men Air Attack 2 for the PlayStation 2. With this advanced cool move, you'll be able to use your helicopter's winch to conserve on your helicopter's ammo and weaponry. And this is how it's done. In Army Men Air Attack 2, the player's helicopter can pick up any world object, like this baseball glove, by pressing the circle button and winching it up. The player can then rock back and forth and if they press the winch button again, the circle button, and release it, they can bowl down enemy units and buildings. Using this advanced tactic, the player can virtually complete the whole game and not use any weapons whatsoever. And that's how it's done. Hi, I'm Jesse with the 3DO Company, and today I'm going to show you a cool move for Army Men Air Attack 2 for the PlayStation 2. With this advanced move, the player is able to pick up a power-up that would normally be used instantaneously, pick it up, carry it to another part of the level, and use it more effectively in an area where it's needed. And let me show you how to do it. If the user's helicopter flies over any power-up like this booby bomb here and presses the winch button, the power-up is instantly used. However, with this cool trick, you can pick it up, keep on moving, and don't stop until you get to the place where you actively need it. This booby bomb destroys everything on screen. So if the user's helicopter stops, every on-screen enemy dies. And so the trick is, Whenever you pick up a power-up that can be used more effectively somewhere else, pick it up, keep on moving, and don't stop until you get to the place where you actively need it. And that's how it's done. Hi, I'm John, a member of the Sony PlayStation Tip Team. Today I'm going to show you a move in the game Dynasty Warriors 2 for PlayStation 2. In it, you'll learn how to unlock Lubu as a playable character by getting 1,000 KOs in the level Hulao Gate. Here's how it's done. In the beginning of Hulao Gate, you will start here, between your own forces and the enemy forces. The temptation is to go straight down the middle of the level, opening each of the gates in turn to make your way to the main gate. If you do this, however, you will have too many of your own troops fighting alongside you for you to get 1,000 KOs before the level is finished. Take this path through the ravine in the right-hand side of the screen, and do not defeat any enemy generals or gate captains along the way. This will ensure that your own forces are unable to break through and give you adequate time to get 1,000 KOs before you complete the level. Make your way to the east side of the map, and then go south until you come to the gate where you must defeat Li Ru to open Hulao Gate itself. And then you will find yourself in a hallway with a seemingly endless supply of soldiers. And after fighting in this hallway for a long time, you should be able to get a thousand kills. If you have trouble doing this, you may want to go back and fight some previous battles to increase the abilities of your fighter, so that you're able to unlock the playable character, Lubu. And that's how it's done. Hi, I'm John from the Sony PlayStation Tip Team, and today I'm going to show you a cool move for the game Dynasty Warriors 2 for the PlayStation 2. In it, you'll learn how to get a sword that increases your character's attack ability by plus 10. This is one of the two hidden items that can be seen on page 22 of the game's instruction manual. Here's how it's done. When you play in the Battle of Heifei, you must choose the side of Sun Quan, or play one of the characters from his army in order to find this power-up. At one point during the battle, Sun Quan's forces will be flanked by the forces of Zhang Liao. Zhang Liao carries the sword that's worth plus 10 to your attack. You just have to get down there and stop him before the game is lost. When you defeat Zhang Liao, he will drop the sword that gives you plus 10 to your attack. And all you need to do is finish the level to claim your bonus. And that's how it's done. Hi, 
I'm John from the Sony PlayStation Tip Team. This is a cool move for the game Dynasty Warriors 2 for the PlayStation 2. In it, you'll learn how to get one of the hidden items that's shown on page 22 of the game's instruction manual. This item is a baby that you can rescue for an additional 2,000 points when you complete the level. Here's how it's done. The baby can be found in the Battle of Chan Bang, in a certain location. It may not be there every time you look, but it will appear during the level as you play. It's in one of these two crates, on this location in the map. If you open the crate, you'll find yourself staring at a cute little baby that you can rescue for an additional 2,000 points when you complete the level. And that's how it's done. Hi, this is Jason Enos. I'm with Konami of America, and I'm here today to show you some cool moves of Metal Gear Solid 2. This time around, Solid Snake is taking infiltration methods to a whole new level. One of the first coolest moves is the new jump out shot, and I'll show that right here. What you need to do is go down any kind of corridor which has an enemy on the other side, get next to the wall, and you'll be able to see your enemy target. Jump out, shoot, and then come right back. The enemy doesn't know that you've hit him, and then within seconds, the enemy is neutralized and Snake can go on his way onto other cool infiltration tactics. The jump out shot is a really important move for Snake to use, so be sure to practice it. Hi, this is Jason Enos from Konami of America. I'm here to show you one of the newest moves in Metal Gear Solid 2. Solid Snake can avoid detection now by hiding enemy bodies. Before you can hide a body in Metal Gear Solid 2, you must first neutralize the guard. To do this, sh shoot the tranquilizer dart into the back of the enemy. He'll be instantly stunned. Now Snake can safely go up, grab the body, and then look for a hiding place. Be sure that there's no other enemies around when you're doing this. And inside here is a locker area, which is perfect for him to hide the body. Let go of the body, open up the locker door, grab the body, go straight back into the locker. Snake will automatically put the enemy inside, shut the door, and now the enemy is completely concealed, and Snake can go on his way. To survive in Metal Gear Solid 2, you're going to need to finesse this move, so be sure to practice it. Hi, this is Jason Enos from Konami of America. I'm here to show you a cool move from Metal Gear Solid 2. Throughout the game, there's many places where Solid Snake can lean over certain ledges. Occasionally, an enemy will scroll by below you, and if you time it right, you can drop down and do a surprise attack on the enemy. What you need to do is to approach a ledge, and then jump over, and then beneath you, you can move left or right to organize your positioning and then when the enemy is directly below snake drop down and attack the enemy and he'll be neutralized immediately so be sure to check out this cool move amongst many other infiltration moves in Metal Gear Solid 2 My name is Saul Villegas, and I'm a tip writer for Sony PlayStation. Today I'm going to show you the game SSX for the PlayStation 2. In this cool move, I'm going to show you a huge shortcut in the level Elysium Alps. Let me show you how it's done. As you make your way through this narrow passage, anticipate the next two jumps before you reach the shortcut. You are number two. When you reach the small sign with two arrows, veer off to the left and jump over the log. Make sure to be using your adrenaline boost the entire time as you jump over the next series of jumps. Listen, ND. Backside 360. Let me, let me kick. That's the 
only trick you ever knew. But the last part of the shortcut, what you want to do is grind on this tree. Only trick you ever knew. Backward flip. Avoid the obstacles and make your way back onto the main track. Now, if you can make it all the way through that shortcut, you're almost guaranteed to get first place. PlayStation 2 is more than just a video game console. It's a complete entertainment system. Last issue, we featured a new technology that will expand what our PlayStations can do. This issue, we thought we'd tell you a little more about it. First person video is a 360 degrees a maneuverable video where the viewer can control which direction they would like to see. Unlike a normal video, it is an active viewing experience. You're actually put into an environment rather than looking through a window at the environment. Initially, we created 360 still imagery, and it was very interesting. You know, it actually brought a person to another space, but it was only a moment in space. Although Enroute designed and built specialized components for the cameras, panoramic cameras have been a goal of photographers for a long time. The concept of 360-degree cameras go back to the turn of the century. 
thing. So the building of the camera was just refining the technologies and our needs. But En Route needs more than amazing cameras to create first-person video. Once the video has been shot, there's still a lot of work to be done. We used eight cameras pointing outward. We're capturing everything simultaneously. Then we take, in this case, eight video streams and we run it through our process that seamlessly stitches all the images together into one video. And then the human operator has to do that last little tweaking and the mind can detect some very small errors. So he has to sit in there and just give it that final last little tweak. And then once he gets that thing set, then the computer can take over. When Honor was looking for a machine to play back their first-person videos, they decided that they needed the power of the PlayStation 2. Well, initially, we were looking for a platform that met several criteria, and the PS2 had enough horsepower to make this possible. Our technology is pretty limitless. It's going to be the consumer that's going to drive the uses of this technology. I'm looking forward to working with the most creative people we can find to see how far we can push this thing.